الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله الله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يضع الساعة ما يطع الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعص الله ورسوله فإنه لا يضر إلا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا أما بعد معشر المسلمين أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله عز وجل فإن الله تعالى يقول بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يشلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحج حج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة. Now as to what follows, I want to pick up on a subject that I addressed previously, but perhaps with some new nuances and emphases, especially since I've done some more research on the subject recently. The subject is, where do you find the mention of the Prophet Muhammad in the previous scriptures? I had to prepare for this topic for my recent debate in London with a certain Dr. James White. And uh, the material I'm about to present to you has already been tested before a live audience uh, composed of many Christians at the Twin Home Baptist uh, Church in London. And also, of course, tested against the other debater who was there and ready to refute me on any point that did not make sense or did not correspond to the factual mat material that is there in his uh, scriptures. So let's think about it then. In the Quran, there is mention of the fact that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, can be found in the previous scriptures. In Surah 7, Surah Al-Araf, in ayah number 157, Allah says, Alladheena yattabi'oon الرسول النبي الذي أن الأمي those who follow the messenger the prophet the unlettered one الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل whom they find mention with them in the Torah and the Injil there there is some in in indication here that if the folks who are reading the Torah and the Injil would look carefully they would find mention of Ar Rasul and Nabi Al Ummi, the unlettered prophet messenger. But do they look carefully? Why do they not find mention of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the previous scriptures? This is what we will try to explore. Another verse of the Quran in Surah 61, verse number 6, has it that Isa alayhi salam said to his people, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ When Jesus, son of Mary, said, O people of Israel, إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ I am the messenger of God to you. مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَةِ Confirming that which was prior to me of the Torah. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ and giving you good news of a messenger that is going to come after me whose name or whose description is Ahmed. Ism in Arabic does not necessarily mean name, it can mean his description or his characteristic. So according to this ayah, Isa alayhi salam announced to people that there is going to be a prophet to come after him. Now this does not mean necessarily that the words in which Isa alayhi salam announced this prophecy about the coming of the last prophet must be written in the Gospels now. This ayah does not say that they will find it in the Gospels. But we do find some indication in the Gospels of Isa alayhi salam speaking about someone to come after him. 
And we will have a chance to look at that in some more detail in a moment. But let's take it systematically and look at the way in which we should understand and read the Bible. The Bible, of course, has been circulated in its parts orally for quite some time before it was finally put into writing. And you know what happens with material that is orally circulated? From one mouth to another, the story changes. And the story changes according to the special needs of the people who narrate the story. So look what happens. In Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, sh should I stop for a moment and explain that the Bible itself is one book, but it's composed of many smaller books? some 66 or 73 books, depending on which version you look at. The first book in all of them is called the book of Genesis. Genesis, as you know, is an English word which uh, refers to the beginning of things. So this one is called Genesis because it talks about the beginning of the world. Genesis, the first book. In chapter 38, we have the story of Tamar and the birth of her sons. She's bearing two sons for Judah, who becomes the father of the Jewish people. When she is pregnant and she's about to deliver, she's delivering twins, obviously. And uh, one baby sticks his hand out, and the midwife ties a red thread around his wrist to identify him as the firstborn. But while he is withdrawing his hand, the Bible says, the other baby rushed out. Now what's happening here, according to the biblical commentators, is that the second baby that apparently rushed out, according to the story, he is the forefather of Dawud And obviously the history is written by the descendants of Dawud So now they want to show that their ancestor is the greater among his siblings. But it is already known that he was not the firstborn. The firstborn is the one who got the scarlet thread tied around his wrist. But for the storytellers, the problem now is, since the firstborn in their culture should have had all of the glory and the greatness and the blessing of God and so on, as opposed to the younger brother, how does the younger brother rise to prominence? How do their ancestor, who was not the firstborn, become so great and important? Or how do they make him great and important, at least in the stories? So they have to deal with the fact that the firstborn is the other person. That for them is a problem. For us it's no problem. Whether it's firstborn or secondborn, first child, last child, baby in the family, doesn't make any difference. And why does the firstborn always have to be the, the male? You can have a firstborn girl as well. But that didn't seem to matter in the culture at the time. The firstborn is more important. But it's not their ancestor. So now they construct a story to at least give their ancestor a winning edge. So now the story is, the other guy is the firstborn, but he only put his hand out. Our ancestor, he beat him to the finishing line. He just touched the finishing line, but our ancestor, he rushed right past it. That's how the story gets constructed, see? Of course, we know that babies are not born in this way. Can you imagine one baby sticking his hand out, and while he is still withdrawing his hand, the other one rushes out? You might imagine his hand must have been crushed. But the story does not have to deal with all of that. The story has one objective only, to prove that the one who was born second does have a winning chance. Okay, that's Genesis chapter 38. Let's peel back the pages and go to Genesis chapter 25. So we're getting to earlier generations. Here we have the story of the birth of Jacob and his brother Esau. Now again, they're twins. Apparently there were a lot of twins born in those times. So they're twins. And the mother finds that the twins are fighting with each other in her tummy. So she can't bear this, so she goes to consult God. And God tells her that two nations are fighting in her womb. Now, of course, nations don't fight in the wombs of their mothers. But what's happening here is that the storytellers are observing that two nations are at war with each other. The descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. And they're projecting what they are seeing now back to the womb of the mother. Not only is the fighting going on now, 
but it started all the way back from the womb. This is how the story evolves and changes and gets told as people are, are looking at what they observe and imagining the beginnings of these things. So now, eventually, the time of the birth comes. And Esau is born first. He's the firstborn son. But Jacob, the other baby, comes out immediately after him, holding on to the heel of Esau. We don't mean Isa, Isa ibn Maryam here. We're talking about Isa, the brother of Yaqub alayhi He's called Isa in, in the Bible. So now the history here is written by the children of Jacob, of Yaqub alayhi And how are they constructing the history? What's the problem for them? We know, of course, that babies are not born like this. One baby comes out, and the other one comes out holding the heel of the first one. But what's happening here? Again, the biblical commentators uh, inform us that the problem for the storytellers is that Isa is the firstborn. But he must be somehow put on the back burner because Jacob must be promoted. He's the secondborn. But what do you do with that as a problem for the storytellers? They have an elaborate story to make him somehow a close runner-up. You've seen the game where the children, you know, they have a little barrel and they pull the monkey out of the barrel. So they pull one out and the other one is hooked on and that one comes out as well. That's pulling monkeys out of a barrel. But babies, of course, don't get born this way. But Esau is born first. The storytellers cannot change that which is a known fact. So they put the, the, their ancestor, Jacob, coming out close after him, holding on to his heels. So he's almost there. He's not quite the firstborn, but he's a very close runner-up. More than this, stories are told in, in the book of Genesis to make it such that though Esau is the firstborn, he does not really qualify. One passage in the Bible says God hated Esau and loved Jacob. And you might ask why? Does God show favoritism for no reason at all? He just hates one of the sons and he loves the other one? Of course, it is not God that hates Esau and loves Jacob. God loves them both. It is the people who are telling these stories that love their ancestor Jacob and hate the other guy, Esau, who was the sibling. This is sibling rivalry at, at its best. We know that brothers sometimes fight with each other, but here it was all the way back in the book of Genesis. So how does Esau lose his birthright? And how does the blessing get transferred to Jacob? There is an elaborate story that when Isaac was about, when he was in his old age, and before he died, he was blinded. And so he, or he lost his sight, we should say. And he said to Esau, my son, go out and hunt uh, for something, and then bring it back and cook my favorite dish, and bring it to me so I can eat, and I will pronounce on you the blessing, uh, a special blessing, before I pass away. So now, Rebekah, the mother of Jacob, hears about this. And she now quickly uh, sends Jacob to go and get some game. He brings it back, she cooks it. Now Jacob comes to present that to the father. And uh, it was known that Esau was a hairy guy, but not Jacob. His skin was smooth. So the mother put some goat skin on his arms and on his uh, neck, and he went up with the food to his uh, father. Now the father could not see, but he could tell, apparently, that something is wrong. He says, the voice is that of Jacob. Are you really Esau? He says, yes, I am Esau. He said, okay, bring me the food. So when he came close, the father touched his hand and touched his uh, neck. And of course, feeling the goat skin, which is hairy, he thought this is the son Esau, the hairy one. Whereas, of course, Esau is still out in the jungle trying to catch the, 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 the game to come back and cook the food. Now, of course, the story is all fictitious. You know that already. Because no father, hearing the voice of one son, is going to think this is the other son. And you don't feel goat skin and think this is human skin, no matter how hairy the human skin is. Goat skin and human skin are so much different. In any case, goat skin will have its own distinctive smell. And, uh, you know, by this time, Isaac was said to have lost his sight, but uh, I'm sure he didn't lose his olfactory nerves as well. He could smell. So the story is fictitious. But at the time when the story was composed and told in this way, it didn't matter that it is a fictitious story. 
because it was told to the people who wanted the story to be true. They're not going to examine it and criticize it and say, no, something is wrong with this story. They're all composing the story together to show that their ancestor, Jacob, is greater than his brother, even though his brother was born first. That is the whole point. It is now that it's in a Bible, in a book, for everyone to read, that we can look at it and see that it doesn't make sense to us. It made sense to the people who composed it, but no longer to us. Now eventually, Isaac, being fooled in this way, pronounces the blessing on Jacob. But now, how do you pronounce a blessing through this kind of trickery? It means that God himself has to be tricked. Because for the blessing to take effect, whatever Jacob is making dua for his, uh, whatever uh, dua uh, here Isaac is making for his son Jacob, for that to take effect, God has to comply. So if Isaac is fooled, who fools God? But again, the storytellers didn't bother with all of this. It was only important to promote, promote Jacob above his brother. So Jacob steals the blessing. He's born second, but he becomes more important. And the other guy, God hates him. The relevance of this now, for what we want to say, uh, it will now become apparent when we deal with the story of one generation earlier. Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salam. By all counts, Ismail alayhi salam is the firstborn. Genesis chapter 16, we have the story of the birth of Ismail alayhi salam. He's 14 years old when his brother Ishaq is born. So nobody can change the fact that he's the firstborn. So according to the culture of the time, he has the prominence. He should get the blessings. But okay, let's say that the blessing should be shared with both of them. We don't mind, firstborn or secondborn. But for them, it mattered. Their ancestor, being the second born, must be somehow promoted to prominence. And the other guy, let's forget about him. So when they write about, uh, about Ismail alayhi salam, in Genesis chapter 17 verse 20, they have the statement that God said that he will make uh, Ismail alayhi salam the father of 12 princes and will make him a great nation. Then it continues, but the covenant, the agreement, the ad, I will establish with Isaac, the second born. Now, the, the book of Genesis says that uh, uh, Ismail eventually wandered in the wilderness and he became a wild donkey of a man and his hand was against every hand and every hand was against his hand. So he's like a warrior, just like Esau was previous to him. Esau was the, the warrior, Jacob was the a humble guy, always in the tents. Now, Ismail alayhi salam, he is the warrior. His son is Haq. He is there, the home boy. He stays with his dad and everything looks fine. But that's told from the point of view of the ancestors of Ishaq alayhi salam. They are the descendants of the second born. And they want to promote him knowing that the first born is the other person. What they do with the first born? Cast him out. So they have it that Sarah... Uh, was jealous, Sarah being the mother of Ishaq alayhi salam, jealous of Ismail, and says to Abraham, cast out the bondwoman and her son. And then God says to Abraham, listen to your wife. So now what must happen to the bondwoman and her son? They must be cast out. So the story has it that Ibrahim alayhi salam took his, uh, uh, his bondwoman, Hagar, uh, and, and the child, and left them in the wilderness with some meager supplies, which eventually very quickly ran out. In the Islamic version of the story, this is by the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to set up something new in that region so that his word would spread in that region. It's not because of jealousy of Sarah. It's because of the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the testing of these persons, Ibrahim and his wife, uh, their tabakkul and their confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will provide for them. But in the biblical story, Nothing of importance can come from Ismail alayhi salam. He's just simply cast out there in the wilderness as if left to die. So now we should ask, is it God that wants to be cruel to the bond woman and her son? Is it Ibrahim alayhi salam that uh, is allowing for this cruelty and cooperating with that and, and doing it himself? Is it Sarah that wants to have this cruel behavior uh, exhibited from her? Or is it the storytellers later on? Obviously the storytellers. They have the problem in their minds. 
that Ismail is born, born first and Ismail is not their ancestor. What do they do with it? They cast out this firstborn so that their ancestor now becomes the only guy in town. That's how the story goes. So now, when one reads the Bible, one looks in vain for some reference of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because the stories have been told and retold. They have been fashioned and remade in order to promote one branch over another one. That's why you don't find such prominent mention of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Otherwise, he would be there. So now the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, verse 18, speaks about a prophet who is going to come afterwards, after Musa alayhi salam, and he's going to be like Musa alayhi salam. So one passage there says that it, he will be from among the brethren of the Israelites. On one interpretation, brethren could actually be very broad and could include the Ishmaelites. Because we know from the book of Deuteronomy itself, from chapter 2, verse number 4, that the Edomites, who are the descendants of Esau, are considered the brethren of the Jacobites, who are the descendants of Yaqub That means the descendants of one brother are the brethren of the descendants of the other brother. But on that principle, if we go one generation back, then naturally the descendants of Ishaq are the brothers of the descendants of Ismail salam. So on one interpretation where the passage says that there, there will be a prophet like Moses who will be from among the brethren of the Israelites, that prophet could very well be from the Ishmaelites. But one suspects that something deeper is at work here. Again, all of the blessing must be saved only for the Israelites, so the storytellers will have it. But we should ask, why should the blessing of prophethood be restricted only for the Israelites? From the Quran, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers to all people uh, throughout time. His guidance, which is so precious and should be offered to all humanity, is in fact offered. Why should he restrict that only to one people? Why only in Israel should you have prophets? Israel is a small plot of land. Think about the vast world. Think about people in South America and in China and in Australia. Shouldn't they have prophets too? Shouldn't they be privy to God's message? Why should you have prophets only in Israel? So then, we understand what is happening. The story is being told and reshaped only to promote one branch, the Israelites only. Let's jump to the story of Isa alayhi salam. Well, here too, we have a baby story along the same lines, to promote one and to demote the other. If we ask most Muslims, they will say that Isa alayhi salam is greater than Yahya alayhi salam. Though there's nothing specific in the Quran or in any hadith I know that specifically compares the two and says that Isa alayhi salam is greater. It is true that there is much more in our traditions about Isa alayhi salam. And who can question the greatness of Isa alayhi salam as depicted in the Quran because he performed many, so, so many miracles. But that does not mean that Yahya alayhi salam is not important. And that does not mean that we should say that one is greater than the other. Isa alayhi salam is included among the Ulul Azm, Mina Rusul, some of the, uh, the men of determination. But that does not mean that Yahya alayhi salam does not have in his own way some special designation and uh, some special uh, position of greatness in the eyes of his creator. Uh, the bottom line is that it doesn't matter to us whether Isa alayhi salam is greater or Yahya alayhi salam is greater. But now let's look into the pages of the New Testament about the story of Isa alayhi salam. We read in the Gospels that Yahya alayhi salam spoke of somebody who is going to come after him. Who is going to be greater than Yahya alayhi salam. So much greater that Yahya is saying, John the Baptist says, I do not uh, feel worthy to stoop down and untie his shoelaces. So who is that person who is going to come after Yahya alayhi salam and be greater than Yahya alayhi salam? The gospel writers have it that that person was Jesus. And many narratives are constructed to prove that it was Jesus. But there are some problems with that proof. First, Isa alayhi salam was actually contemporaneous with Yahya alayhi salam. According to one narrative, Isa was 
uh, born six months or, or was conceived six months after Yahya salam. In other words, Yahya's mother Elizabeth was already six months pregnant with Yahya when Isa was conceived. Six months difference doesn't make that much difference. They are contemporaneous. They live in the same milieu and they come and meet with each other. So that's the first problem, one of chronology. They are contemporaneous. He doesn't come after. Second, when one reads the narratives, one finds that there are telltale signs that Yahya was actually considered to be greater than Isa alayhi salam. But the storytellers tried to cover that up. One of the signs, and biblical scholars are very clear on this, they say that this is a fact. One of the signs is that followers of Yahya alayhi salam continue to exist who did not become followers of Isa alayhi salam. We know of this from Acts chapter 18. Some of the followers of Yahya alayhi salam at a place called Ephesus were still baptizing according to the baptism of Yahya. So we can understand from Muslim theology that each prophet has his followers and that's fine until the world prophet comes when of course every uh, follower should be follower of this one prophet. But at the time there could be several prophets each of them having their own followers. So this is fine. But if Isa alayhi salam was to achieve the prominence that the New Testament writers give him, then all of the followers of Yahya alayhi salam should have converted to be followers of Isa alayhi salam. And the proof in the Bible is that there were many who did not. In fact, biblical scholars say that for a long time there remained some competition between the followers of the two prophets, Yahya and Isa. And now the narratives are constructed by the followers of whom? Followers of Isa. And now they want to prove that Isa alayhi salam is greater than Yahya. So they construct a number of narratives to prove that. One of the narratives is our familiar baby stories. We have it that when Maryam alayhi salam conceived of Isa, according to Luke chapter 1, she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was now by this time pregnant with Yahya. And Elizabeth says, oh, Something marvelous has happened. From the moment you gave me the greeting, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And the narrative says that immediately the baby was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now let's deconstruct this story. First, how do you know that a baby is filled with the Holy Spirit at a particular time? Any Christian who says he or she has the Holy Spirit will admit that the Holy Spirit is something that is very subtle. It is not something that you can see coming and going. No ultrasound test is going to show you that this baby is filled with the Holy Spirit. So how did anyone know that the baby is filled with the Holy Spirit? Okay, Elizabeth says that the moment your greeting reached me, the baby leaped for joy. Now sometimes mothers will report that they feel a couple of kicks down there. But how do you know that the baby leaped for joy? How do you know the baby's state of mind, whether he is joyful or sad? How do you know he's leaped for joy? What if he's frightened? How do you know what is the case? Or are you just giving an innocent little kick? It doesn't really matter, joy or no joy, fear or whatever feeling. But now you can understand what's happening with the story. Isa alayhi salam has to be promoted over Yahya alayhi salam for the storytellers. They have to prove that their prophet is the greater than the other one, even though there are signs showing that Yahya alayhi salam was greater. From the Bible, it is clear that Yahya was baptizing people for the forgiveness of sins. And Isa alayhi salam also went to him to be baptized. So the conclusion that one might draw is that he also went to be baptized for the forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. And as Professor James Keith Elliott explained in his book entitled Questioning Christian Origins, for the Christian storytellers, the problem was to explain how could the Son of God be going to the John the Baptist to get himself baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And so they had to now construct stories to show that Isa alayhi salam is greater than John the Baptist. Even though, prima facie, from the looks of it, John the Baptist is greater because he has a blessing to confer on Isa. He has the baptism, Isa has to come to him. So now they construct stories to get over this problem. Once we realize that these are constructed stories, we understand then that John the Baptist is speaking about someone to come after himself who is greater than himself. 
And that would have to be the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it could not be Isa alayhi salam. It is also very interesting that in Matthew chapter 11, Isa alayhi salam himself says that there has not been anyone born of women greater than John the Baptist. And he himself is born of a woman by all confession. Even the Bible specifically says that Isa alayhi salam is born of a woman. So now if he by his own word says that there is none born of a woman greater than John the Baptist, that means he himself is not greater than John the Baptist. And if John the Baptist says that one coming after him is greater than himself, well then that is not Isa alayhi salam. Put two and two together. If A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then obviously A is greater than C. And so, the one to come after John the Baptist is greater than John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is greater than Isa alayhi salam. So it's all very clear. The one that the John the Baptist is saying is going to come after him is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, very clearly. But we don't have time to go into more details about some of the specific... then in short that when one is looking for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the Bible one has to be able to read past the surface narratives read past these baby stories and look at the real essence behind the narratives and see what is going on what was the problem they're trying to deal with how they try to overcome it remove that attempt to overcome the problem look at the problem squarely in the face and realize that what we're dealing with here are narratives which in fact at the core point to someone who is going to come after uh, Musa alayhi salam, who is going to come after John the Baptist Yahya alayhi salam, who is going to come after Isa alayhi salam, one who is a great prophet of God greater than John the Baptist so much greater that John the Baptist himself does not feel worthy to untie the shoelaces. That one is to come from the progeny of Ismail alayhi salam because the blessing to Ismail alayhi salam was that he will be made into a great nation. And how does God make a great nation? By giving them the guidance, not oil, but guidance from himself that will help them to navigate their way through this life and into the life hereafter to all eternity. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا ما يدي الله فلا مضل له وما يضل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد وصلى الله تعالى على جميع الانبياء والمرسلين والملائكه المقربين والخلفاء الراشدين ابي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين the young man who just gave me this note uh, informs me that his uh, grandfather passed away uh, this morning and uh, his dad of course may be here as as well they're always praying here the whole family comes here from uh, elder all the way down to a, a, a a little toddler uh, who runs about here sometimes. So they're very much connected with this musalla. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept our dua for this uh, brother Masum Ali who has passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give him the genital firdaus and have mercy on him. Ya Ahmad Rahimin. Allahumma fil al mu'minin wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat al ahiyai minhum wal amat inna kasamin al karibu al jibutawat. Allahumma ayyid al islam wal muslimin. Allahumma ansur al manna suradina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Waj'alna minhum. Allahumma akhthul man khadha الذين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا معهم اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا حاجة هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Allahu Akbar Allah